You know, um, we have an interesting perspective on so much about what's happening in this industry. And many of you, we're working on helping you improve your organizations. But what Thomas and I talk about most of the time is how to improve your business, how to improve the company overall, the company's profitability. And I'm gonna say that 2022 is gonna go down as a pivotal year in our industry. And I'm gonna tell you a little more about why I think that is. But I wanna start by going back. You know, we have made over the course of many, many years a, a lot of sort of wild claims. In 2009, we said subscriptions are gonna become the dominant model for most technology B2B companies. And at that time, the vast majority of companies absolutely disagree. No way, that's not how my customers wanna buy from us. We're never gonna go there. Well, it turns out we did go there. We also said in 2011, you know, as we investigate the economics of recurring revenues and subscription-based business models, we're really realizing they're different economics than the economics of our old ownership-based transaction-oriented model. And once again, there was a lot of skepticism. We said, when we look at the top performing companies in these models, they have advanced capabilities that many companies don't have. I mean, that was really when customer success, as an example, started to emerge as a go-to function for companies who were in a subscription model, right? And now, look at how big the customer success community has become. It's become the biggest community inside of, of TSIA in a relatively short number of, of years. We also said that these capabilities that you need to add, your business model is not gonna support adding and adding and adding and adding costs, right? And now today, I'm here to tell you, and you're not gonna like it, and your companies are not gonna like it, and your sales organization is not gonna like it, but we think the answer to the economic problem of profitable SaaS lies in the cost associated with your sales force, okay? So for many, many, many months and years, we've been saying basically this. We've been saying that we think the problem is really around sales costs. And we were somewhat alone. Most companies didn't want to hear it, didn't want to think about it. Um, but more recently, uh, we had somebody else come by our side and say, yeah, this is important. And that company was Salesforce. Less than a month ago, Salesforce made the commitment that they are going to reduce their cost of sales and marketing from 45% of revenue to 35% of revenue. Now think about that for a second, right? That is taking something like 25% of the costs out of their sales and marketing engine, right, as a percentage of all revenue. That's a pretty bold statement, but I think they've reached the same conclusion we've reached, which is this sales cost, and you look at so many born in the cloud companies, where's the financial problem? It's in their cost of sales and marketing. And as I'm gonna say to you in a minute, it isn't that we're overspending in marketing, if you know what I mean. Um, and so this is going to be, this is going to be a super important topic. How do we take our current sales cost, which in some cases, for some of you who are born in the cloud companies, sales costs have exceeded total revenue in certain years in the history of your company. Imagine that, paying more for sales costs than the total revenue of the company, all right? So, the big question, the number one question we get is, hey, TSIA, you said all these things, a lot of them have turned out to be true, you know, we're on a journey. How do we navigate all this? And what's so interesting to me is how we're gonna look back on 2022. 2022 is gonna be an inflection point where the born in the cloud companies and the large and company, 
uh, incumbents, their business models started to come together. Thomas has already called 2023 the year of profitable X as a service. 2023 has got to be the year where we as an industry learn how to deliver subscription recurring revenue profitably. And why is that? Well, look at 2022. 2022 started off great, right? I mean, it was like, boom, we were coming out of COVID, but we were really rocking and rolling. The stock prices were way up. Super good. Super good. Um, and, and the guidance to the born in the cloud companies from their private capital providers was just grow. The money will be there, the cash will be there, just grow. And what was the main way to grow? Salesforce, right? Then all of a sudden, inflation hit. The economy has been heading toward what looks like it might be a recession. Top line growth for many tech companies has started to slow. And as tech growth slows, the percentage that you're spending on sales and marketing goes up, right? Because your revenue is not growing at the same rate, so it gets higher. And stock prices sagged, and raising capital became super expensive. Now, uh, many of you who've been to our, a lot of our events over the years know that I have a love-hate relationship with the venture capital community. Uh, and, but as soon as this all started transpiring, they pivoted like so fast from just grow to, hey, you gotta be profitable, right? Boom, overnight, they're like saying, we've been telling all of our portfolio companies, you know, it's gonna be hard to raise capital right now, it's gonna be hard to go public right now, gonna be doing, you know, all these things are gonna be super expensive for you to go do. You gotta figure out how to be more profitable. And I would say that, is bringing the industry together. It's not like there were two models. There used to be the board in the cloud, no profit, high growth model, and the large incumbents whose share, shares were held up by their profitability, right? Don't let the dividend go down, right? Our value investors, what do they want from us, right? Now, we're coming together around a common thought which is that we're all under pressure to improve pop profits, but not at the expense of revenue growth. How many of you are hearing something to that effect right now? Yeah, most people. We're under pressure to improve profitability, but not at the expense of top line growth. And I'm gonna argue we can't evolve slowly into that model without some risk. You know, we, we were, we had our executive board meeting this morning and we were talking about an economic sentiment survey we did in July um, with all of you, uh, hundreds of companies, about, you know, what they expected for the, for the future. And, you know, it was like, oh, we think we're gonna grow, but budgets are gonna be under pressure and all these things. Again, evidencing what I just said. The, the word is continue to grow, but, do more with less, right? Try to figure out how to do more with less. And then we asked the people in the board, what do you think's happened since July? Have things gotten better, right? Are there any economic tailwinds now that we have that we didn't have July? Not really. We still have supply chain challenges. We still have a lot of backlog we can't deliver. We still have high labor costs. We still have inflation driving up the cost of living for all of our employees. I think we're gonna to have to really start thinking about how to do things differently. And I'm going to say that, you know, that transformation is gonna be hard and scary, and it's gonna involve all of you. Everybody in this room is gonna have a role to play in this transformation, because what I'm gonna be proposing that we need to do today involves all of you and your organizations contributing to this broader transformation. So in order for me to talk about that, 
I, you know, to envision what this journey is going to be like, I needed uh, an example company. So I made one up. I want to introduce you to Exco, all the tech you'll ever need. Okay? Now, Exco has some very great qualities to it that make it easy for us to use it as an example of the transformation that we could put our companies through. The first is, Exco's financials are conveniently round numbers. It is a $1 billion company. It is growing at 10%. It has a 5% profit, and it's got a 35% cost of sales and marketing. Okay? That may be a little different than you, right? You may be more profitable, you may be less profitable, you may be spending a little more on cost of sales and marketing, a little less on cost of sales and marketing. You may be growing a little faster than 10%, a little slower, right? But you'll get the picture. As we use this company, Exco, as a model today, we're going to look at how these numbers can change over the course of the transformation that we're saying our industry has got to go through. But let's unpack that $350 million in cost of sales and marketing. Where is it going? Well, I can tell you, and Exco realizes this, they're really not doing anything serious around centralized analytics function and placement function in their organization that's designed to help make sales much more efficient or, you know, it's kind of there, but it's kind of being done willy-nilly by different departments a little bit, right? It's basically not funded. Similarly, they don't really have a true digital customer experience platform under development. Again, support has its platform for cut portal for customers and, and you know, the, the, um, the, we can do some e-commerce transactions here and there, but we don't really have a true end-to-end -end digital customer experience and we don't really have funding to enable that to happen. At Exco, customer success is more like an art project than an organization. Yeah, there is a function called customer success. Yeah, there are some CSMs. Are they really a full-blown, mature customer success organization? No way. No way. They're spending money on marketing, but their marketing is really around, oriented toward helping salespeople with land, right? Land, new business. That's where that $25 million is going. It really isn't doing much to drive adoption, expansion, and renewal, right? It's really not focused on the entire revenue life cycle. It's very much focused on that initial land experience and helping the sellers to get leads and brand awareness and so they can do that initial land. There's a lot more that marketing could be doing, but isn't. So where is that $350 million really going? 320 million of it's going to sales. 320 million of it is going to sales. Now, Exco knows. They know that's not the way forward. They know they can't go on with no commitment to analytics, no commitment to building a digital customer experience, underinvested in customer success, underinvested in marketing. They know they're smart folks at Exco. They know that's not the future. The question is, how do they transform from the situation they have now to the business they know they need to be for the future? Exco is stuck in the middle of the fish. You know, this new book that we have that just came out called Digital Hesitation talks about digital transformation in two contexts. One is for the incumbents, the legacy companies, getting their portfolio to subscriptions. That's step one. And the wave one, we call it. And wave two is about reinventing their operating model, reinventing how they sell, how they deliver, how they service. This company's classic. 
they're now well north of 50% recurring revenue. The majority of the revenue is coming from subscriptions. That was a big goal for them, and they got there. But they're really stalled on this question of how do we rethink and transform the way we engage with customers from what I'm going to call the old model to what I'm going to call the new model. Okay? So they say, hey, TSIA, you know, how do we do this? So, right, it seems like a really daunting task. And what's clear and what we're working on is a playbook, a playbook for how companies can successfully transform the way they operate, the way they interact with customers, and the economics that are going to go along with that. Now, uh, again, you may say, like people did in 2009 when we said subscriptions are going to be the future, you may say, this won't work, this isn't going to happen. I would submit to you, it is going to happen, has to happen, has to happen, has to happen for all of us, born in the cloud companies and traditional large leading incumbents in the industry. And we're going to work on this playbook over the course of the next year. But I'm going to give you a little sneak peek at some of the things we're going to be talking about and recommending. So right now, in that book, and in all of our literature, we're asserting, asserting a few core things. One is, it's possible to fundamentally redesign how your company generates revenue, right? At Exco, revenue generation is owned by sales, period, end of story, right? Every dollar that goes through goes, goes to the top of the income statement, virtually all of it goes through sales. Maybe support contracts don't, a couple other things, but the vast majority of it runs right through sales. And we're going to say we can reorganize that, redesign that, and have revenue responsibilities spread out in the organization as the customer makes a journey from land, adopt, expand, renew, and repeats. And if you do it correctly, we believe you'll come out growing faster, lower cost of sales, and a sales force that is actually doing better at quota achievement than they are today. And the key thought in all of this is how do you move transactions to the right resource in the company doing the right work, the right transactions for that customer by the right resource at the right cost structure, okay? So for a lot of born in the cloud companies in particular, it was perceived that growth versus profits, you couldn't do both. You could grow, you're gonna be unprofitable and the venture capitalists were gonna fund you, or you could be profitable, slower growth. In the large company world, we've been in our history growing and profitable, but more recently the growth has been slowing, right? We're super profitable if you're a Cisco or Microsoft and so forth, but really growth versus profit shouldn't be a choice, right? We have to have a business model where we can do both. And so we're toying with this idea of a battle plan, basically, the A player battle plan, and I'll go into that in a minute. And this battle plan involves four things. Getting what we're going to call a layer view of your business. Number two, getting responsibilities assigned out across the company for this journey, this transformation we're going to go through. Number three, going through six waves, six waves of activity over about a four-year period in which you will come out the other side looking very differently than you do today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about using Exco as an example. What kind of results are possible in this transformation? This is the journey to profitable X as a service. It's the hardest single thing your company's ever done since it was founded. I promise you. It's going to be super hard, super tricky, nerve-wracking, but it's something we got to go do. So the first thing we need to do is, is to get a layer of view of the business. 
Now, what is, for those of you who may be new to TSIA, what is layer? It's land, adopt, expand, renew, right? It's the journey that a customer goes on from the time they first start doing business with our company and then hopefully out into the future forever. Land, adopt, expand, renew. So for Exco, we said, hey, Exco, that billion dollars, we need to start separating it into land, expand, and renew. Now, importantly, when we talk about landing, we're not just talking about new logos. What we are talking about is selling to new buying groups, so people we're not really doing business with, or significant new portfolios of our product line to the same buyers. But these are big deals, either way. Could be a new logo, right? Could be selling a whole new product portfolio to an existing customer. Could be selling to a different division. But they're the big deals, the important deals. The deals that I would argue we really want sales focused on, okay? So, when Exco did this, they said, well, really, we have about a, we knew it. We have ARR under contract. We have about $600 million in ARR under contract. We have about $300 million in new land business we do every year. And we have about $100 million of expand. Isn't it nice that XCO's, Exco's numbers are so round and we can, we can work with it so simply? So they got this view. They knew how fast each one of those was growing that made up their 10% revenue. And then we said, hey, you need to kind of divide those up a little bit. We need to go one more click down. What are the high complexity transactions, the medium complexity transactions, the low complexity transactions? Maybe you think about it as my SMB customers versus my mid-sized customers versus my large enterprise customers. You need to sort of break that all out. And then we want you to apply some legitimate data, right? which is what are the renewal rates and what are the expansion rates of those segments? Now, that may sound hard to do, and there may be some arguing inside the company, but this is a super important view. We're gonna use this view as basically the scorecard of our business model transformation. Now, one final thing is needed, which is we need sales to tell us where they're spending their time on these segments. Now, <clears throat> that is gonna be a, a little bit like this experience. <laughs> right? When the company goes to the sales organization and says, hey, <clears throat> we need to know how much of your time, our resources are being spent on these different kinds of transactions within the business, you're going to get a lot of, who the hell are you to come in here, right? You're going to get that. But Exco, their CEO, their leadership team, they were behind this. They know they got to make, so they, damn it, we're going to do it. Damn it, we're going to figure it out. And when they did the allocation, it turns out, they found out that about 45% of sales time was actually going toward renewals. About 40% was going toward landing, big complex transactions. And about 15% was going toward expansion. Again, selling basically more of the same products to current customers. That's sort of our definition of expansion, right? And for Exco, even getting this far started to point some things out. Number one was how expensive that land revenue really is. How ugly our first year economics are around landing new customers. And, and that our strategy for changing that is pretty barbaric. Our strategy for growing land is more salespeople, right? If I have more salespeople, sell more. Less salespeople sell less, right? Second thing is they said, geez, sales is spending a lot of time on adoption and renewals for our medium and large customers, right? Almost 45% or 45% of all their time is going on 
making sure customers are happy, right? Making sure they're going to renew, getting involved in the renewal, right? And they're saying, geez, is that really the highest and best use of this very, very expensive resource we have called sales, okay? So they right away began to sort of circle around some concepts that they thought they wanted to go after. The next thing is we would say, hey, look, we're putting together this A player battle plan, TSIA is. We need to kind of absorb what they're saying, right? And in anticipation and planning of this next four year process that we're gonna go through. And we need to figure out what role services has in this, what role success has in this, what role product has in this. Because TSIA is telling us all of these organizations are gonna be involved in making this transformation possible. So I told, showed you what, talked to you about what layer is. Let me talk about what A player is, okay? A player is basically the idea that we could, we're not, but we could be taking the internal data from our systems, the telemetry data that we're collecting from our customers, available third-party data about our customers and prospective customers, and we could be developing models for what customers are likely to need next. What they're likely, whether it's a problem that they need resolved, whether it's a second use case, whether it's an expansion, right? We could, you have this data, and if you haven't seen the, my keynote from Orlando, I literally list out all the data you need, where it resides, how it comes together, okay? But we are gonna fundamentally become a customer data and analytics driven organization. And that analysis is going to help us place resources, the right resource with the right capability at the lowest cost across the customer life cycle. Meaning, we are gonna place the right seller at the right time with the right opportunity. We're gonna drive CSMs to be conducting the right transactions at the right times. We're gonna direct the certain things to digital customer experiences, right? To allow customers to self-service. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk a lot about the role of success and services going forward. But we are basically gonna become much smarter at placing the right resource with the right capability at the right time in the customer's journey. This is a very different idea than sales owns the customer, right? This is basically saying we have a process. We have a process that cuts across every single part of our business, and that process is gonna own the customer, right? Now, there are gonna be you know, customer success managers, and there's still gonna be salespeople and all these things, but we're really gonna build this data-driven engine. And this A player concept embraces four strategic pillars. One is what I mentioned, which is moving transactions to the lowest cost capability, no matter where that capability sits in the company. Number two, we have to significantly monetize services separately from the subscriptions. Lots of companies are on a journey of embedding everything in that SaaS license, right? Or whatever it is, right? Support's in there, customer success is in there, you know, maybe even some implementation services are in there. It's all in there, we gotta unpack that. And we're gonna talk about unpacking that. The third thing is, we got to convince development that product quality, which is driving service transactions, hard to implement, hard to upgrade, bugs, hard to use, whatever it is, that that stuff is preventing our service and success businesses from focusing on what really matters, taking the resources and redeploying them to things that add value to the customer's experience, that improve the customer's business outcome, 
not fix shitty products. I know that completely unfamiliar concept to anybody <laughs> out there. And lastly, we, we've really got to start funding the digital customer experience. You know, I mean, just ask yourself, I mean, can your companies, can your customers digitally order anything? Or do they have to talk to a salesperson, right? Or talk to a telesales person? Can they go self-service if they want to go buy something? Can they go buy it? Don't know. If they want to see where an order is, can they self-service, right? So we have to get on that. But for today, today, our purposes, we're going to focus on these top two, right? Moving transactions to lowest cost channel and monetizing services. Because at the end of the day, these are the things that are going to transform the operating model of the company until those longer term projects down below, right? It's going to take you more than four years to build a complete end-to-end -end digital customer experience for your largest customers, right? That's going to take a little while to get on. But these things we can do. And when we talk about moving transactions and we talk about aligning cost with capability and value, again, look at our teams today. We have sales teams. We have expand and renewal specialists. We have CSMs. We have TAMs. Many of you have TAMs. And we have, hopefully, some degree of automation and e-commerce. So the question is, what do you want those organizations doing? I would submit to you, as I said, sales should be focusing on the large complex transactions. That's where they add the most value. If we've got a renewal, if we've got a renewal coming up, that our data, our model is telling us highly likely to renew, super high customer health score, history of renewal, all that kind of stuff, low probability of expansion. That customer's industry is struggling, the public data says that they're not really growing, so they're going to renew, but they're not going to expand. Why would you put a salesperson on that opportunity? Why would you do that? It can be handled by a CSM. If they get in trouble, they can escalate to a renewal specialist. And I'm going to talk about why that's so important. So we've got to align, and I'm not just talking about, by the way, I'm not just talking about commercial transactions. I'm talking about every transaction. I'm talking about a transaction that's going to facilitate adoption, right? I'm going to talking about a, a, a problem that the customer's having that, that they're trying to overcome. I'm talking about the next use case, you know, as, as one of our people in the board meeting was saying, hey, you're using tab one, but you're not using tab three. Other companies are using tab three of our product, and there's a heck of a lot of value in there. Let's get together and talk about how tab three could help you. So I'm talking about every kind of transaction you can think, right? And the interesting thing as we look at what you guys are all doing today, there's emerging kind of an order of things, right? You know, layer is land, adopt, expand, renew. But as we go on this journey together, we're not going in that order. We're focusing on adoption first, renewal second, expansion third, and land last, right? Think about the evolution of customer success inside your company. Its first job was adoption, right? Drive the adoption, improve the adoption, okay? The second job, hopefully, was we're gonna start letting maybe our SMB renewals we're going to let those renewals be processed over in customer success, right? Some of you, some of you are doing that, and you're saying, geez, there's also kind of expansion conversations that are coming in over the transom, and we ought to be able to allow a specialist or a CSM or somebody to process that transaction. Let's not, let's not make it so we have to send them out and create a drag on the a time drag on sales to go do this simple thing, right? So the order in this battle plan is really adoption first, then renewals, then expansion, then land. And super important, all the way along this journey, we are getting better and better and better 
and more mature on two themes. One is this analytics and placement capability, which is going to become core to how the business operates, central to how the business operates, every part of the business. And we're going to get better and better and better at monetizing services separately from the subscriptions. And we know that to make this work, every single, I mean, th there are representatives from every one of these organizations in this room today. There's representation, representatives from customer success, support, managed services, education services, professional services, sales, marketing, product, IT, G&A. Everybody has a role in this transformation. And so do your partners. And that is super central, right? As we think about this journey, we have to figure out not only who's going to do what between us and our partners, but as we build these capabilities on this journey, how are they going to access them? How are they going to get access to the internal capabilities? What these analytics are saying and telling us to do and, you know, giving us the right capabilities and skills in our CSMs and our support people and so forth. How do we let them play with our tools? And I do want to say, um, central to all this, is this notion of taking customers on a data-driven journey to their best outcome from your products and services. I would argue most of us do not even know why our best customers are our best customers. Why are our best customers our best customers? What are they doing that's different than other companies like them that are not so adopted, that are not using tab three, that are not buying all of our premium services. What's the difference? What's the journey that they went on that the average customer or the weak customer who's like them isn't going on? And what is that journey? So that we can go to any one of our customers and say, you're here, you could be there. Here's a set of transactions designed to help you move along the road to this best possible business outcome from your relationship with our company. And that data, that data is also going to determine what we call propensity. What are they likely to do next? Right? You've all got it today. You have got at-risk renewal indicators. Right? That's a propensity model. That customer right there, the way they're scoring, they are at risk. Okay? Do you have a propensity model for expansion? Do you have a propensity model for next most likely product? Do you have a propensity model for customers who need more education or more consulting services? Right? You, you do have a propensity model for on-prem customers who are going to have a service problem, right? You can tell that in advance, and you dispatch resources proactively to prevent that problem from occurring. So we do have some propensity models, but they're not anywhere near they, where they need to be. Customer data and analytics and the data in our systems has to help place resources, drive the digital customer experience. We're going to use them in something, if you haven't been reading about product-led growth, PLG as a, as a business strategy where the actual use of your product in the use of features and functions, there are triggers to drive, exp, exp, adopt, expand, and renew, right? So the business capabilities that you want, adopt, expand, renew, intermingled in with the actual features and functions of your product designed to have a, a product-led growth experience. No salespeople involved, okay? As, again, a long journey but we got to go on these journeys. But what they all come together is around this data. So we're going to take behavioral data from customers. We're going to have a propensity model for what they're going to do next. We're going to route that to the right capability at the lowest cost. They're going to run the play. It's either going to succeed or failure. And we're going to update the data so that we get better at it the next time through. Right? And this centralized analytics and placement engine we can already tell you, and by the way, at TSIA, everything we tell you to do, we do. Everything we tell you to do, we do, right? We don't always do it great, but we go, we go, 
we want to learn. I can tell you something that I've seen at other companies, and it's certainly true here. This analytics function, which is going to be the beating heart of our businesses in the forward, in the future, cannot be in sales. It cannot be in sales. It cannot be in customer success. This organization has to be seen as having no internal political agenda. It has to have access and extract data from every system in every organization. And nobody gets to go like this, right? No other department in the organization gets to go, you can't have that data, right? They have to let the data and the analytics speak truth regardless of consequences. Speak truth regardless of consequences. What that means is, and I'll tell you our own personal journey, we used to have a major account sales team at TSIA. Any of you who work at, at large tech companies, um, there was a, a team of very senior salespeople who your, were your relationship managers, you know, multi-million dollar relationships, and they handled land, expand, and renewal, and they messed around with adoption, which they shouldn't have been doing, right? Today, and, and we, we said, you know, damn it, we're going to start going on this journey. We're going to become a data-driven company. We're going to start trying to move transactions to the lowest cost model. And their reaction was, that's suicide. That was their reaction. Suicide, if you go do that. But then we started peeling back the data, right? And we started saying, hey, what, you know, based on our customer health score as an example, could we predict who was going to renew and not renew and start using CS resources earlier in the life cycle and doing all these things? Today, today, we no longer have a major account sales organization. We don't. It's disbanded. It's disbanded. Our standard sales force is handing all the lands and our member success team, the people you work with every day, is handling adopt, expand, and renew. Okay? Some of the expansions might kick over, need a little sales help, but the vast majority are not. We got there because the data supported the thesis. Kicking and screaming, kicking and screaming, but we went with the data. And that's why this organization can't have a political agenda. So where is it going to sit? I don't know. Maybe it's under your CFO. Maybe it's under this new role, which, where we would kind of advocate, which is a chief revenue officer. Chief revenue officer is not the head of sales. They may also be the head of sales. But the CRO function is about analyzing the process of revenue generation and optimizing it, both in terms of maximization and in terms of efficiency. Most sales organizations, efficiency is a secondary concern, right? What they really want to do is generate maximum revenue. So they're super good at that, but the efficiency conversation kind of falls on the wayside, right? The chief revenue officer carries very much about the cost of sales and designs systems and processes across the entire company to systematically reduce that. Maybe, maybe there's a new chief analytics officer role that comes out. But clearly, everybody plays a role in this. Customer success, support, managed services, a lot of the data is going to come from you and your systems, right? You have got to not only capture this data because you're working with the customer every day, you got to identify the barriers to adoption and the barriers to expansion, get the solutions, and put them into our tooling, right? You have to be willing to get involved in more commercial responsibility. You have to be willing to get involved in some renewals, some expansions, to take responsibility for some of those things. If you're in education services or professional services, you've got to identify and implement uh, use case optimization for customers. You've got to create and distribute knowledge to the other organizations. Again, playing a value-added role, taking customers on a journey to the next leg of value in what they already own, right? Marketing and product. We have got to get adopt, expand, and renew capabilities inside the product experience. 
It can't just be, here's a bucket of features and functions, there's your CSM. Good luck, right? They've got to be brought together. We've got to be doing the right things in product experience. And we've got to start thinking about what product-led growth might do to us. If you're in IT and GNA, Jesus, you've got to simplify the business. God, you've got to simplify. You've got to simplify CPO. You've got to simplify transaction processing. You've got to simplify all these complex systems that we have built up all these years. And by the way, for a lot of companies, this is the hardest part. The hardest part is actually getting all these legacy systems that we have built up over the last, you know, 10, 15, 20, for some companies, 50, 60 years, and getting them ready for this data-driven journey. And if you're in sales, you've got to start learning to trust other organizations in your company. You've got to replace, you've got to learn to replace cold calling with what we call warm calling, which is where is the data telling us you should be spending your time today because we know this customer is ready to move to the next thing and here it is and here's why. And we've got to move to industry and outcome focused delivery and discovery. And our salespeople stink at that. They don't understand much about different industries that we serve, right? We've got to solve that in order for us to go on this journey. So this is the planning process. This is the modeling process. This is figuring out. Here comes the tricky part. How do I fund this journey? Okay? So once I've got the plan, how am I going to go do it? And this is what we envision that journey look, looking like. Six waves of activity. The first is what I call adoption learning. Us understanding adoption. Fundamentally understanding adoption. All of our customer segments. The second is beginning the renewals journey and taking that data and really getting it into a digital experience that can support our employees and our customers. The third step is CS and services heavily monetized as subscriptions separate from the basic SaaS agreement. The fourth is climbing the renewals ladder. Maybe in step two, you started with your small and mid-sized SMB customers. Now we start to climb the renewals ladder, taking on more and more and more commercial responsibility for renewals over a period of time. Also, after that, taking on expansion capability, allowing services and success employees who encounter expansion opportunities the ability to process the transaction, the ability to talk to the customer about what's next for them. And lastly, lastly, we're going to reform the land motion. We're going to turn layer into full-blown mature A player. We're going to do this hopefully over about a four-year period. And we're going to fund it because with each wave, remember that time analysis? We're going to start giving time back to sales. We're going to start giving time back to sales. Okay? And as we do that, we say, geez, if, if you don't have to worry about adoption, you don't have to worry about a lot of your renewals, we can take some expansion. What do we want you to do with your time? We want you to do the harder work. We want you to land more business, more logos, more big expansions. We want you to do the highest and best contribution, action that you can do for our company. We're going to give you more time to go do that. And that is going to allow you to increase the land targets for sales people. Now, if you increase the land targets for your sales people because you're giving them back more time to go focus on that, you have two choices as a corporation. One is you can keep your revenue relatively flat but do it with fewer sales people because they've taken on more quota per person. Or you can say, I'm going to keep all the salespeople, but I'm going to raise their quota. If I do that, I'm going to get more revenue, and I'm going to use some of that revenue to fund these activities. Okay? The second thing, as we go on this journey, we're going to reduce the incentive cost on these transactions. This is actual data. This is your data. Okay? When sales gets paid on a renewal, 
and we move that to a renewal specialist, the commission cost drops by half. If you can take that renewal and move it to a CSM, it drops by half again, right? Think about how much money your company pays in sales incentives, okay? For transactions that they may not be needed for. So how are we gonna get there? Wave one, we're gonna give customer success and services adoption responsibility for our mid-market accounts. Many of you have done that, but our objective there is to learn adoption, to get the insight into the barriers to adoption, how we're gonna solve it. We are gonna financially improve the renewal rates. And that rule, improved renewal rate is going to contribute to the growth of the customer success organization. We're going to reinvest those dollars of the higher renewal rate in customer success and services, and we're going to increase the land quote of the sales force because we're giving them back a significant chunk of time. We're saying, you don't need to worry about this adoption in these, these accounts. We're going to go do it. So you can take that 10 or 12 or 15% of your time. You can go land 10, 12, 15% more, more land deals. Now, you may ask, why do you start with why did I say start with your mid-market customers? It doesn't have to be there. Many of you have started with your top customers and worked your way down the pyramid in terms of, of driving adoption, right? The mid-market, the nice thing there is if you do your learning here, you don't screw up your top accounts, right? You can't do it in the SMB customers because quite frankly, you don't touch them. You don't really touch them as much. And the economics of touching them make it very, very tough. So that mid-market is where we think a good place to start in collecting the learning and the insight and the data that you need. Next, we're going to begin funding these other journeys, digital customer experience, product-led growth, advancement and placement, and we're going to begin taking on renewals. We're probably going to do that for small customers. We're probably going to build digital platforms, auto renewal, right, self-service renewal for our smaller customers. And that is going to improve renewal rate. That's going to, again, contribute some money. And it's going to improve sales and partner efficiency because customers are going to be happier. And we're going to also take some of that money and fund increases in the analytics and placement capability of the business. Wave three is we're going to really work hard on monetizing customer success and customer services separately. We're going to turn customer success from a cost center to a profit center, which allows it to get control of its own financial destiny and invest more in the customer success function. If they do that, if we do that well, we're going to give the company either a new revenue stream or a bigger revenue stream. If services used to be here, services is going to be there. And we're going to move thinking about investing in services and success from a cost of sales and marketing to service cogs, where you guys have control over what happens with the money. Number four, we've proven we can handle some basic renewals, and we start climbing the renewal ladder. We're going to use our, advanced, our analytics and placement model to separate out the high risk or high reward renewals everywhere and bring sales in. But where there are standard renewals without high risk and without high reward, we're going to handle it in context of a customer service, customer success touch point. Okay? Let it flow naturally. I think our data is suggesting you can come out of that with equal and maybe even better renewal rates equal and maybe even better renewal rates, but sales is given back a considerable amount of time. And what are they gonna do with that time? We're gonna get them to go out and sell more land. So we're gonna have additional renewal revenue if it went up. We're gonna save a truckload in commissions. We're gonna start maybe reallocating some people from traditional sales into like specialist functions where they're handling at-risk renewals inside. And again, we're going to increase land quota. Now, when you do this, you got to be super careful. You got to be super careful. Um, 
you got to make sure you've got a resource on the task that's up to the job, right? And you have to look yourself at the people you have in customer success and say, how many of these people could do a certain type of transaction, okay? You do not want to overshoot your capability. Um, you want to make sure you're aligned, that you have got the capability to process these. Again, in our company now, all renewals, no matter how big they are, are processed by our member success organization. There's no sales involvement in renewals, okay? Fifth wave is customer success, not CSMs, but the customer success organization begins taking on expand targets. Basically, you say, I'm gonna let the adoption lead the expansion, and I'm gonna let the CSMs or specialists I'm gonna lead them to the right opportunity. That's gonna increase the rates at which customers expand, and once again, it's gonna provide funding for us to continue on this journey. Now again, as you all know, those of you who have tried to do expansion within customer success and services, again, you gotta be super careful. You don't wanna confuse the CSM about what their job is. Their job is to drive adoption and let things unfold naturally from there. Let the expansion come. Let the renewal come. So you can give them BCTs, right? You can give them targets, but you don't want to put them on a sales comp plan, right? And then finally, in the last stage, layer becomes A player. Now I've matured this capability. I've invested in every phase along this. I've invested more in customer success. I've invested more in analytics and placement. And now I'm going to really say, hey, sales, we have the data and the capability to target you not just for expansion, but potentially for land. We can tell you what customer, what prospect in the world is the best place for you to spend your time today. Which one of our existing customers is the ripest for land? And we're going to get more efficient across the board. We're going to be able to be more efficient at CS, services, and we're going to fund, again, all of this by increasing quota on land. Okay, Whew. four years. What did we achieve? What did we achieve in six waves over four years? First is, first is, we're a much better customer experience. We don't have all this complexity surrounding our core value proposition. The complexity of dealing with multiple people from different organizations who don't talk to each other. We've got an underlying process that makes the journey to our value a much smoother journey. Now, if I'm the CEO of XCO, how did I fund this journey? Well, let me tell you the before and after picture. Remember I said in the beginning, the data and analytics capability had a zero budget. Now it's got a six and a half million dollar budget. Our digital customer experience platform, we had no centralized team working on that. Now we have eight million dollars on that team. Remember our customer success art project? Five million dollars. Now a 68 million dollar organization. Our marketing is up by almost 40 percent as we begin to drive into marketing across the entire life cycle. And our sales costs, option number one, have been reduced to fund all of this. Our revenue was relatively flat, but we moved dollars with every one of these waves. We moved dollars and we reallocated sales budget to these other functions and grew it. And overall, by the way, the total cost of sales and marketing for this company went down and all these organizations now are adequately funding, funded, and the total spend on customer sales and marketing is down so much that the profits could be double what they were at the beginning of this journey. That's option one. Option two is we're gonna keep all those salespeople, but we're gonna give them more land quota targets every single wave. We're gonna hand them back sales time, and we're gonna increase their targets. So option two for Exco, as you remember, they had $300 million in land business. They were spending 40% of their time, sales, to go get that. Over the four years, we gave them 40% more time, 40% more time back to focus on land, and we took their quotas up 
and we are now have $600 million in land revenue, a $300 million revenue increase, and all of that other stuff, the higher customer success spend, the marketing increases, the analytics team, the digital experience, all that together costs 90 million bucks. So we're paying for all that out of the $300 million more land business that we had four years ago when we started this journey. Other things could happen. You could have higher overall renewal rates. I guarantee you, you will have less discounting. I guarantee you, you will have less discounting in this way. And you're going to have better margins as more customers self-serve. The financial model for doing this is knowable and doable, right? And we're going to learn lessons along the way. Customer success and services have got to be willing and prepare to take on more serious commercial responsibility. And all of you have to think about, I mean, everybody is somewhere on this journey. Some of the things I've talked about today, you've already done, right? But really, really, serious commercial responsibility, what is that going to mean to us? The second thing is the burden of data and proof through this journey, the primary provider of data is going to be customer success. Customer success has got the closest, best visibility um, into what is going on at these customers. They've got to be feeding data in, into this process. The compliance and accountability for acting on data, if the data says, hey, you need to go do this, Mr. Salesperson, or hey, you need to go do that, Mr. S customer Success Manager, they need to go do it, right? These waves of, are you and your partners, but the main point, and I think this is what we're saying in 2022, that is hard to hear, that a lot of people are going to say, this is never going to happen at your company, but it will happen at your company, is that if we want total cost of sales and marketing at our company to go down, but we need customer success investments to go up, we need marketing costs to go up, we need investments in sales and customer success analytics to go up. If we want all those three things to go up, but the total cost of sales and marketing to go down, there's only one way to do it. There's only one way to do it. Sales costs need to go way, way, way down, or land revenue needs to go way, way, way up. And you cannot be afraid to make this journey happen at your company. And so what I'm asking you today for is awareness. I'm asking you to start conversations inside your company. Hey, you know what those TSIA guys are saying? I want you to start thinking about who in the company maybe needs to get involved in TSIA's literature, in the book, and come to conferences. This is going to be a process of socialization. We need you to make that happen. It is your job as an employee of the company to help the company and we're telling you this is the journey we've got to go on. It's inevitable. We have to go this way. There's no other way we can go and get to where we want to be. It is masked by doing well. You know what I mean by that? It is masked by doing well. If, you, if you're doing well now, you're going to delay. You're going to say, ah, we don't need to go on this journey. We're doing well. Bookings were good. Did well through COVID. Not having a big impact. Doing well masks the need for this journey. Don't let that happen. This is a multi-year journey. It is going to change the customer experience. There are going to be winners and losers in this journey. Be a winner. Thank you very much.